recording because I always keep forgetting it to start. Uh, okay, recording started. And I'm just going mute. Thank you, Paul. Here you go. Okay, cool. Thanks, Maria. And uh, thank you, everybody, for, for coming to listen to what I've got to say. So we're going to talk this morning about transaction log performance. Now, um, Maria's recording the session. It's going to be up on your YouTube channel once we're done. I'm also going to give Maria a PDF of the slide deck and also a zip file of the demo so she can post that stuff up there as well. Now, as we're going along, I'm going to stop every so often and say, hey, any questions? So if you have any questions, type them into the, the GoToWebinar interface, and Maria's going to read out whatever the questions are to me. And we'll take some questions as we go along, and then at the end of the session, I'll hang around for uh, as long as Maria is able to, and as long as you guys have questions as well. Okay. So just a couple of quick slides about us. Um, SQL Skills, you, you probably recognize some of the people on that slide. We, uh, we all work for SQL Skills. We do training, consulting, blah, 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 blah. We have a bunch of classes coming up. We have a class in uh, London in August on performance tuning, and we have another class in Dublin in Ireland on performance tuning in October. And there's just an example of some of the topics that we cover in our classes. And if you're interested, there's a link down at the bottom, and you can go and see all the training dates and costs and all that kind of stuff. And a quick introduction about me. I used to work for the SQL Server team for about nine years. I wrote a whole bunch of the SQL Server storage engine, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so the interesting stuff, my email address is there again, paul at sqlskills.com. If you have any questions at all about the, the topic that we're talking about today, the transaction log, and you don't get a chance to ask it in the session or to have your question answered, so if you're looking at the, the session afterwards or if you're watching this on YouTube and you have a question, by all means, send me an email. And just make sure you say global Hebrew uh, user group question in your title of your email, because I get lots of emails every day, and I'd like to make sure that any questions from user groups that I presented at kind of bubble up to the top of my, my question list. And then also, uh, my blog link is there. Uh, lots and lots of um, useful information on our blog. We all at SQL Skills, we all blog an awful lot. No marketing and advertising, any of that kind of stuff. Uh, I might even dive into a blog post and show you some stuff as well. And then on Twitter, there's a very vibrant SQL Server community on Twitter. And uh, you can follow me there, at Paul Randall. And there's another cool thing on Twitter, which is called hash SQL help, all one word. If you have a, a problem, and you can tweet it in one or two tweets, at hash SQL help on the end, and a whole bunch of people around the world listen to that, and you'll get free advice, which you can't beat free, right? And then the last thing before we get in is we have a bunch of online training on Pluralsight. And just for coming to the user group today, I'd like I always like to give out uh, free codes, so free pass for be able to watch all of our plural site stuff for 30 days. And there's no catches, that, you know, you don't have to register and all that kind of stuff. You don't have to give a credit card. It's just totally free. So if you're interested in that, then just shoot me an email and I'll give you a, a user group, uh, sorry, a plural site code. And as an example of the kind of stuff we have on there, we've got about an hour to talk about transaction log performance today, but there's a seven hour long course all about log and recovering the transaction log that you can watch on there. And again, you can watch it totally for free. So that's all the kind of marketing stuff out of the way. What are we talking about? Why is this stuff important? Well, the transaction log is probably the most important part of SQL Server. Okay? Without the transaction log, you're unable to have transactions that can be made durable. And if a crash occurs without the transaction log, you wouldn't be able to recover the database. You also wouldn't be able to roll back a transaction. You also wouldn't be able to do things that use the transaction log, such as replication, backups, mirroring, and so on and so on. So because the transaction log is such a a, a, an important integral part of SQL Server, you've got to make sure that it performs well. And if you've got a performance bottleneck in your transaction log, that can make it a problem for your overall workload. So what we're going to be talking about today is a little tiny bit of transaction log architecture. And I go into a huge amount more depth in that uh, Pluralsight course if you're interested in watching that. And then we'll talk about the I.O. performance of the transaction log and how you can monitor what's going on with that. We'll talk about what does sequential IOs, what does random IOs to the log. We'll also talk about some, some kind of macro performance problems you can have, like the log is full up, or you've got too many VLFs, and we'll, I'll explain what VLFs are as we go along. And then I'll do a, a very brief overview of a couple of features that were added in SQL Server 2014 around the transaction log, and I'll do a demo of one of them for you. So very small amount of log architecture first. So the transaction log is split up internally into little chunks called virtual log files. And most people just call them VLFs. And that's what I'm going to say from now on. And the VLFs, the reason it's split up into these little chunks is to allow the log management system to more easily manage 
what's going on with the transaction log, which parts of the log are available for being written into, which parts are unused, and so on and so on. You get a certain number of VLFs when you create your transaction log, and you get more VLFs when you add more or the log file grows. Okay. So going a little tiny bit deeper, so we have our VLFs. Now inside each VLF, okay, there's a series of what are called log blocks. And the log blocks are what hold the log records. The log blocks initially start off at 512 bytes each, and they grow up to a maximum size of 60 kilobytes each. Okay. And you can see that what I've done here is I've, I've made it look as though there are varying sizes of log blocks. And when a log block ends, if you will, when it reaches whatever size it's going to reach, it has to be flushed out to disk. And we're going to look at how that flushing works in a second. Right. So inside the log blocks are a bunch of log records. So you can kind of think of a log block really as a kind of equivalent to a database data file page, although data file pages are fixed size at 8K. But they have a little header, and they have a series of table or index records on it. It's just kind of the same kind of thing as a log block. So what we've got here, you can see from the different colors, that's meant to represent log records from different transactions. They're all kind of intermingled inside a log block. There's no, for instance, there's, if we've got multiple transactions going on, we don't have like all of Maria's log records are in here, and then all of my log records are in here, and all of Kimberly's log records are in here. If we have concurrent transactions happening, then we have log records being generated as the actions occur inside SQL Server. And so we've got, say, some log records from the green Maria transaction and some from the blue Paul transaction, and they're all kind of intermingled. So when a transaction commits, okay, whether it's you saying commit transaction or whether SQL Server started a transaction under the covers for you, right, what has to happen when a transaction commits is there's a special log record generated, and it's this one here, LOP commit tran, and this stands for log operation. This is just the name of the log record. The log record is generated, and it's written into a, a log block, one of the log blocks in the, the VLF. And then that log block has to be written out to disk. Now, there's an exception to this case, which is delayed durability. But forget this, and we'll talk about this a bit later on, and I'll do a demo of it. Let's just say for now that on all versions, right, and then most of the time in 2014, whenever a transaction commits, the log block that that log record is written into ends. doesn't matter what size it is. It ends, and then it must be written through to disk, right, such that when you are told your transaction committed, like you get the five rows affected message or something like that, then you know that that transaction is durable. It's on the disk, and if a crash occurs, then the transaction's effects or effects will be present in the database after crash recovery has run. Okay. Now, if you have something like synchronous database mirroring or a synchronous availability group, then you're not told that your transaction is committed until two things have happened. First off, the local log block is written out to disk. And also, that log block is copied across to the mirror, or the, the, the synchronous replica, if you're running an AG, and it's also written out to its log drive. Okay, it doesn't have to be replayed, but it just has to be written out, such that if a crash occurs on the local system, and a failover occurs to your, your synchronous replica, for instance, then the effect of that transaction is going to be durable, and it's going to be present over there as well. So our log block gets written out, and then any locks that the transaction is holding, so for instance, if we're in the the default read committed isolation level, any, any changes we've made to the database are going to be protected by exclusive locks. So those locks are held until the log block has flushed to disk. And then the logs get released, and then we're told our transaction has committed. Just a little look at what's going on under the covers there. So we have our series of log blocks, and we commit a transaction. And in the the most recent log block, that's where that log record goes saying we committed the transaction. And then our log block has to be written to disk. So the, the thread that is running our transaction inside the storage engine copies the log block to an internal cache called the log cache. And there's one of these per database on your server. You can't change the size of it. And the log cache has enough space to be able to hold 128 full-size log blocks. Right? So our log block that we're committing is copied into the log cache. Right? And that's, what, that's still our thread that's doing that. If there's an awful lot of transaction log activity, there might not be a buffer available in the log cache. And you might see a, a wait type called log buffer. 
Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about weight types uh, in a few more slides. So once our thread has written that log block to the log cache, then our thread goes to sleep. And our thread is suspended. And it's suspended waiting for the weight type write log. Okay. So something then has to go and take our, our block, our log block that we copied into the log cache and write it out to disk. And this is what's called the log writer thread. Okay. So there's one thread that does all of this log writing for all databases across the server. And up until up to and includes 2012, that will be SPID number one. And for 2014 and onwards, it's SPID number four. And so this is responsible for doing all the writing of all log blocks that are written out to all databases on your server. Now this doesn't, this isn't a bottleneck, okay? To have just having one thread. So our, the log writer thread does an asynchronous write of our log block. You might say, well, how, why isn't it synchronous? Well, if it was synchronous, you'd only be able to do one at a time, and the log writer would have to wait until that synchronous write completed, and that would be a huge, huge bottleneck. So instead, it's asynchronous. And there's a certain number of concurrent asynchronous writes that there can be to any one database, and we'll talk about that as well. So the asynchronous write happens, and then the log writer carries on with whatever it's going to do next. Right? We're waiting for the asynchronous write to complete. And our thread here is still suspended. Right? So this is the thread that was running and did the copy, and now is suspended over here. And what we're waiting for is for the I.O. subsystem to complete the write, and then some other thread will run what's called an I.O. completion routine. And the I.O. completion routine essentially allows our thread to be told the log write has completed. And then our thread can carry on running. Okay. So our, our thread, again, copies the log block to the log cache. It then goes to sleep. The kind of background log writer thread does the write out to disk. And then some other thread will complete the I.O. and tell our thread your log write has completed. And then our thread, when it gets back onto the CPU, will go and release all the locks and complete the transaction. Okay. So any questions so far about what we've talked about, Maria? No. No. No questions till now. Okay. Okay. And don't worry if you guys don't have any questions. I mean, you can go and, you can go and uh, view the presentation again and send me questions in email. So don't worry if you don't have any questions right now. So the transaction log writes are, they're always sequential, okay? There's no point ever where a SQL Server will write randomly into the transaction log file. It is always writing on, conceptually, the, the right-hand side, if you will, of the log. So if you create, if you have a performance issue and you think, oh, I'll add another extra log file to see if that will help, because sometimes that can help with data file performance, that's not going to help with the log because the log will always write out sequentially. So if you have two log files, for instance, it will write sequentially all the way through the first log file, then it will move to the second log file, write sequentially all the way through it, and then go back to the first file. Okay? So it's never ever going to write out in parallel to the log files. Now I should clarify and say it's never going to write out log records in parallel. There is one special case where you will, if you're monitoring IOs to the various files, you will see it every so often write out in parallel and you'll see the, what's called the file header page at the start of each log file, page zero, or offset zero in the file, being written out whenever something like a log backup occurs. Okay, but that's not log records. Log records are always written out sequentially. Now, there are some hard limits in terms of the number of concurrent asynchronous writes. So just going back up a slide, what we're talking about here is the number of kind of in-flight writes that the log writer has, has started for any particular database. Okay. And that limit up to and including 2008R2 is 32. Right. So that means that up to and including 2008R2, you can only have 32 concurrent writes, so 32 log blocks in the process of being written out to disk for any particular database. And that can be a bottleneck if you have a, a, a slow I.O. subsystem, for instance, and you have a workload that's causing lots and lots of very small, like 512 byte log blocks to be written out. So for instance, say you've got a very small table row size, and you have lots of concurrent inserters, and you've got a slow I.O. subsystem. 
then on 2008 R2 and before, you might actually hit that limit of 32 outstanding IOs. And then that's hard to work around, and we'll talk about some of the things you can do in a few more slides. Now on 2012 and 2014, that number has been raised to 112. Right? And that means it's an awful lot harder to hit that hard limit, if you will, on the number of, of in-flight log block flushes. Now, I hadn't seen anybody hit that until uh, last November, and I was talking about weight statistics in my pre-con session at PASS in Seattle. And I was talking about this particular slide, and uh, I said, I've never heard anybody hit that limit. And then somebody at the back of the room put his hand up and said, we've just hit it in our system. So I've seen lots and lots of people hit this limit. Right? I've only ever heard of, of one person hitting this limit. It's a lot harder to hit. But as with any hard limit, as hardware starts to get faster and faster and faster, then you'd be able to eventually hit whatever hard limit there is inside SQL Server. Now, in terms of outstanding I.O., there's, there's these limits on the number of outstanding I.O. operations. There's also a limit in the total amount of, of log that is in flight at any one time. Okay, so you've got this limit, number of I.O.s, and this limit, size of I.O.s in aggregate. I've never seen anybody hit this limit. Okay. So this is the one that you, you have to be a little bit wary about. And how can you see this? You can see this by looking at the average disk write queue length in the physical disk perfmon counter, for instance, for your log drive. So different things that do sequential log reads. So we've already talked about writes. Writes are always sequential. Now, most of the time, reads are sequential as well. So the probably the most common reader of the transaction log that if you asked anybody, they would, they would guess this, is transaction log backups, obviously. So a log backup has to read all the transaction log that was generated since the last log backup occurred. Now, also, any kind of data backup. So a data backup, like a full backup or a differential backup is also going to read the transaction log because these data backups have to have enough transaction log in them to be able to essentially run crash recovery as part of running uh, of doing the restore. So it has to back up enough transaction log to be able to do that crash recovery. And then transactional replication. So the log reader agent job that's part of transactional replication also has to read through all the transaction log to harvest committed transactions since the last time it ran change data capture that's an enterprise edition from 2008 onwards. That actually, under the covers, uses the log reader agent job from replication to go and harvest changes that have occurred in the database. Database mirroring and availability groups, they also read through the transaction log. But there's a, from 2012 onwards, there's a little bit of a twist for, for these guys because there was a, what's called a log pool was added once you've got database mirroring or an AG setup where Instead of having to read from the disk, for instance, to get the, the log, the, the log pool caches in memory some of the transaction log as well. So that if you have an asynchronous mirror or an asynchronous AG replica, they're not causing log reads to occur to the actual log file. Because that can be a performance issue if you've got, depending on your I.O. subsystem, of course, if you have a whole bunch of reads and a whole bunch of writes happening at the same time in your log. And then another thing that can, call, that can read through the log is if you're in the simple recovery mode, and we'll talk a little bit about the recovery modes in a few more slides, and, you, and a checkpoint occurs. When a checkpoint occurs in the simple recovery mode, that allows the log to clear or truncate, basically marking some of these VLFs as unused and available for reuse. Okay. So that's transaction log reads. So random log reads. Okay. Basically what's going to cause a random log read is having to roll back a transaction. So any time that you manually roll back a transaction, it's going to have to manually read through the log. Because the, the way that the, the log records work is they're linked kind of backwards in order. So let me just jump back to an earlier slide. Let's jump back to this one. The log records are linked backwards. So if we've written up to, say, here, and we roll back a transaction, then we'll undo the log records here. Then we'll have to see what's the previous one, because we have to undo them in reverse order. So we'll kind of jump backwards a little bit through the, the transaction log to maybe here, and then jump backwards to here, and jump backwards to here, to undo all the, the log records in our transaction. And so that's essentially a random read into the, the transaction log. Let me just jump forward to where I was again. So rolling back a transaction is going to cause random reads into the, the log. Now, crash recovery. 
crash recovery you can think of as rolling forward a bunch of transactions that have been committed at the time of the crash and then rolling back any transactions that were uncommitted at the time of the crash. So it's going to be doing random log reads as well to do those rollbacks. Whenever you create a database snapshot, the snapshot is created and then the system runs crash recovery on your source database, the real database, but it runs it into the database snapshot. Okay, so it doesn't affect your source database, but it means that your database snapshot is a transactionally consistent copy of the database. So it's going to be doing crash recovery, which does rollbacks, so random reads. Now, whenever you do a CheckDB, CheckDB creates a database snapshot under the covers, which then runs crash recovery, which is doing rollbacks. Okay. Doing a DML trigger, SQL Server 2000, if any of you are still running SQL Server 2000, which I'm sure some of you are, then the, the way that DML triggers work on SQL Server 2000 is the before and after tables in your trigger body. If you access those in your trigger body, that actually goes and reads the transaction log. That's no longer the case from SQL Server 2005 onwards, where it uses the versioning mechanism that underpins snapshot isolation to do DML trigger body processing. And then, of course, you can manually look inside the transaction log using the undocumented FNDB log command, which I've, I've blogged an awful lot about. So there's sequential writes, sequential reads, and random reads. How are we doing for questions, Maria? Any so far? I have a question from Adi Coin. When we have a nested transaction, only last commit commits the transaction. Is only the last commit causes the log write to the disk? Yes. So I always like to say that, that nested transactions are a joke perpetrated on us by the query processor team because they don't actually exist. Right? So if you do begin tran, do some stuff, that generates some log records, including a begin tran log record. If you then do another begin tran, so you create a nested transaction. That, that does nothing in the transaction log. Okay, you can actually go and look with FMDB log and, and prove it to yourself. The, the nested transactions themselves do not write anything to the log in terms of begin tran or commit tran log records. So the, all a, begin tran, a nested begin tran does is bump the at at tran count. And if you're doing a commit tran, the, actual, the transaction won't actually finish committing and cause the log block flush to occur until at at tran count equals zero. What's even worse is if you roll back at any point in, from a nested transaction, it rolls back all the way to the outer transaction. Okay. So this is one of the reasons, I mean, uh, not, not knowing what's going on with your nested transactions is, uh, uh, I wouldn't say it's a common issue, but it's an issue that I've seen quite a few times. And some of you might have seen code at the end of stored procs saying, while at at tran count greater than zero, commit tran. Okay. It's horrible to see because that just says that developers really have no idea what's going on with their, their transactions and their nesting levels. But yes, the, the, the answer to the question is yes. A nested transaction won't force the log block flush until the final commit. Anything else, Maria? Yes. Um, Andrei Zavatsky asks how to view the number of outstanding IOs, which DMV? The number of outstanding IOs at any one time you can look at using the um, sys.dmio pending IO requests. DMV, and I'll just I'll type it in here so that you see that um, question and to see number of outstanding IOs. And it, it is this dot DM IO pending IO requests. And if you go to my blog and search for that, you'll be able to to see an example of using that DMV. Now the interesting thing is that this DMV gives you an instantaneous view of the number of IOs. And it's going to show you the number of IOs across the entire system. And what you can do is you can aggregate them together and you can sort it by file type and by database ID. So you can have a look at any one time and see how many IOs are outstanding from inside SQL Server. And the other thing you can do is you can go to the perpma counters for the physical disk that the log file is on or your log files are on. And you can look at the um, average disk write queue length. And that'll show you over time what the, the, the number of outstanding IOs are. So two different ways you can do that. Um, Anything else, Maria? Yes. Um, Aguirre Yeshev asks whether is everything is the same no matter, no matter which recovery model is. Whether there are differences. Uh, yeah. 
there's, there's no differences in everything we've talked about so far in terms of the recovery models. I'll talk about the recovery models in a few more slides, and I'll tell you what the differences are when we get there. Yeah, that's it. No more questions. Okay. All right, let's carry on. So, a few things that you can do to monitor transaction log I.O. Right? So, you can look at the average disk seconds per write, and this is the, the Windows view of how long each I.O. is taking. Right? You can also use the log flushes per second and the log flush weights per second to look and see basically how many log blocks are being flushed out per second, and I'll show you an example of, uh, of that in a demo at the end of the session. And you can also look at log flush waits per second. So how long is, uh, how, how many times are we having to wait for log flushes? Now these, although they're there and I list them, they're kind of hard to use because should the log flushes per second be high or low? Now it kind of depends on, on your workload. There's no, there's no right answer for whether it should be higher or lower. And it's one of those things where you really need to, to monitor it. And when your system is performing well, you take a note of what the number is. And then you can compare the current number against your baseline, essentially. Kind of the same as page life expectancy. If there's no right answer for what that number should be, you have a look and see what it is when your system is running okay, and then if it deviates from that, then you know you might have an issue. So two other DMVs. This one, sys.dmio virtual file stats. I'm going to do a demo of this in a second. This allows you to get the, the average read and write I.O. latency, so how long each I.O. takes reading and writing for all the files across your server. Now, it says here it's better than the physical disk per one counter because the physical disk per one counters are per drive letter or per LUN, for instance, whereas DMIO virtual file stats allows you to look at the per file level. So it's a nice, a better granularity. And it's also SQL Server's view of what's happening at the I.O. subsystem, whereas the, the per one counters are Windows's view of what's happening. And then there's that DMV that I mentioned on the previous slide, DMIO pending IO requests, which I won't demo for you today because we don't have time to do everything. But then you'll be able to find out some information about that on my blog with some code that you can use as well. And there's also a wait type that we can look at, write log. I mentioned this already. And I'm going to show you an example of looking at write log wait types in my demo. And there's also, if you want, you can use extended events. And there is a way that you can track what's going on with log file IO. And that's actually provided for you as a template in Management Studio from 2012 onwards. And uh, Jonathan covers that in his Introduction to Extended Events course on Plural Sites. So the write log wait, right, as I mentioned before, it means that our, our thread is waiting for a log block to be written to disk. And it's waiting essentially because it's in the middle of committing a transaction. And it can't finish the transaction log commit until the log block has been flushed to disk. So the the knee-jerk response, and I see a lot of people doing what I call knee-jerk performance tuning, where they, they see a symptom and they immediately jump to a conclusion and say, oh, that must be the problem. Okay. So don't, don't have the knee-jerk response to a write log weight of adding extra log files. That is absolutely not going to help you. Okay. Another common knee-jerk response is thinking that the, the I.O. subsystem where the log file is has a, has a problem. Right. Now, this, this can often be the case where the log file is on a slower portion of the I.O. subsystem, and one of the things you can do is move it to a faster portion of the I.O. subsystem. But don't immediately assume that it's the log file that has an issue or the I.O. subsystem that has an issue. There's other things that you can do to, to try and fix what's going on with the transaction log. So one of the things that I might look at first is look and see whether the, the average wait time for the right log wait, and I'm going to show you how to do all this stuff in a, in a minute, is the same, is, is kind of, it's hard to say exactly, um, within, within, a, a, um, within a degree of accuracy of the, the average write time to the log file from DMI virtual file stats. And what I mean by that is, say your average write log time is uh, 30 milliseconds. Then if you see the IO virtual file stats time being 15 milliseconds, that means 15 milliseconds of every write log wait is nothing to do with the I.O. subsystem. It's inside SQL Server. And so that might show that you've got uh, a lot of contention happening inside SQL Server for that log cache, for instance. Right. And we're going to talk about what you can do about these things as well. Also have a look for the average disk write queue length to see whether you've hit that hard limit of 32 or so, or 212 on 2012 onwards, of the number of concurrent I.O.s 
that can be happening to the log as well. Right? And then you want to look for, for things that are causing extra log writes to occur. For instance, do you have a lot of very tiny transactions? Right? Do you have a lot of page splits happening, lots of fragmentation? That also generates a lot of extra transaction log. Do you have unused indexes? That generates a lot of extra transaction log as well. So let's have a look at some of the things you can do to monitor what's going on with the transaction log. Very simple demo, but just showing you some of the techniques that you can use. So I've got a bunch of scripts here, and as I said, again, I'll create a zip file and send them off to Maria so she can put them up on, on your web page. So what I've got is I've got a, a USB stick plugged into my laptop, and I'm going to use that as the I.O. subsystem for my transaction log. And of course, this is not something that I recommend that you do in production. Ha -ha. So I'm going to go ahead and create my database. And my, my log file is on H colon here. And that's the, the USB stick. And then I'm going to create a very simple scenario where I've got a database. I'm going to stick the database in the simple recovery model. So we're not having to deal with log backups and stuff. And then I'm going to create a table that has a bunch of different columns. And I've got a, a GUID column, but it's a sequential GUID, so it's not going to be causing page splits. I've got a date time column, and I've got just some padding here. I've got 100 bytes of uh, padding, just to make them a little bit bigger. And I've got a clustered index on my sequential GUID, and I've got a non-clustered index on my date time here. So I go ahead and do that. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to fire up a couple of hundred clients. Right? And the way that I do that is I have a, a, a script here. And I'll just blow this up a little bit. I have a script here, add 50 clients, and that's going to call the run log client.cmd 50 times. And run log client.cmd is going to execute log client.sql. And that just inserts a record in a while loop into my, my table. So I'm going to fire up a couple of hundred of those. And then we're going to have a look at what's going on in the transaction log using the weight statistics and also using IO virtual file stats. So over here, I've got a script that's going to allow us to look at weight statistics. And I've got two of them, weight stats one, and I've also got another one sitting over here, weight stats two. And that's so that I can compare and contrast between the two portions of my demo. And if I just go ahead and run this script, I'll show you what it does. It basically shows me all of the, the weight statistics that have occurred since my server was restarted. And this is just a bunch of random stuff that uh, I've been doing on my server over the last day or so since I last rebooted my laptop. So I'm going to get rid of all that stuff because you can flush out the weight stats. You can clear them. And I'm going to go ahead and clear my weight stats. So I'm only showing you the stuff that's happening from the demo. Right. So then let's go ahead and start up 200 clients. So 50, 100, 150, 200. Okay, so now we've got 200 clients hammering away at our server. And we can look and see what's going on. So there's three different things we can do. We can look at weight statistics through the DMV DMOS weighting tasks, which is this DMV here. And this is a DMV that I like to call the what's happening now DMV, because this shows us all of the threads that are currently waiting for something. So if I run this, I just hit F5. We have five a few times. We're going to start to see a lot of write logs occurring. Okay, lots of write logs. So if we look at our aggregate weight statistics, we're seeing write log weights. That's the most prevalent weight type. So two different ways of looking at weight statistics. There's the the DMOS weighting tasks what's happening now DMV, and then there's the classic DMOS weight stats DMV, which is show me everything that's happened in the past. So if we look at this, what we're seeing is the write log. We've got an average wait time here of 22.4 milliseconds, right, which is a really terrible time to have to wait for, for a log write to occur. So we might say, OK, we've, we've got this, what looks like a bottleneck here. What does it look like from the IO subsystem point of view? So we can go across to this script. And this is going to show us DMIO virtual file stats. Now, you have to do a whole bunch of math, because this DMV gives you a bunch of aggregates, and we want averages. So if I go ahead and run this, and let's just scope it down to log files. 
So this is showing us the average read and write latency or the average read and write I.O. time for all the log files on my server. And what we can see is that for my slow log file, I'm seeing an average write latency of 22 milliseconds. So that matches the time here that we're seeing for the write log wait. So that says to me that there's no, there's no bottleneck inside SQL Server, if you will. All of the component of that write log wait is from the actual I.O. subsystem. Okay. So one of the easiest things that we can do to reduce that write latency is put our log file on a faster portion of the I.O. subsystem. So we've currently got it on a USB stick. Obviously, it's a contrived demo. So let's stop the test and move the I.O. subsystem, or sorry, move the log file to a different portion of the I.O. subsystem. So I'm just going to click Stop Test. And then go back into my setup script and change my log file to be on C colon. So now I've got the data file on one of the SSDs in my laptop, and I've got the log file on one of the other SSDs. And I'll go ahead and rerun this entire script to set things up again. Okay. And then I'm going to leave this set of weight statistics here. I'm going to go into my other weight statistics window and flush out the weights that so I can show you the difference. Okay. So let's fire up our 200 clients again. 50. 100. 150. 200. So now we've got our 200 clients going again. So let's go back up to our waiting tasks window first of all. And let's run that a few times. And now we're not seeing any write log waits there. Okay. So we've, we've changed our test characteristics. So we've removed the threads having to wait a long time for write log. So if we go across to virtual file stats, for instance, and just re-execute this, now we see here's our slow log file database. Now we're seeing it our average has dropped down nicely to almost nothing okay, for our writes, which is great. If we go to our aggregate weight stats and execute this, what we're seeing now is our write log weights are now on average a millisecond, maybe two milliseconds, compared to 22 milliseconds. Okay, so a very, very simple change moving the log to a faster portion of the I.O. subsystem drastically reduce the write log weights being a bottleneck on our system there. Okay. So there's a couple of different ways that you can look at what's going on with the transaction log. One using weight statistics and another one using virtual file stats. Any questions, Maria, on that demo there? No questions. Okay. Okay, so let's move on. So some of the things you can do if you find that write log is one of the most prevalent wait types on your server, and it's very common to see write log being one of the most prevalent wait types. So what I just did there, move the log to a faster portion of the I.O. subsystem. That's a very simple thing to be able to do. So another thing you can do is if you're seeing that, if you think you've got lots of very tiny log blocks being flushed out, you can actually make your transactions bigger, which kind of goes against all of the wisdom of, of running SQL Server. We usually want our transactions to be small and fast. But as far as log performance is concerned, small and fast transactions don't translate into high-performance transaction log. Okay. Now, making your transactions larger is very much easier said than done. It's not a simple thing to re-architect your, your system to do that. Okay. What is easy to do, though, is to make sure that you're not writing out more log than is necessary. So what you could do is have a look and see that you've got no unused or duplicate non-clustered indexes. Every unused or duplicate non-clustered index is overhead for the log. Because whenever you do an insert, update, or delete on your table, then a row has to be inserted or updated potentially or, or deleted in each of your non-clustered indexes. And that generates transaction log, and it's a little transaction that does that, which causes a log block flush. Right. If you're doing things like um, page splits, if you're having lots of fragmentation, then that means you've got lots of page splits occurring. Page splits are hugely costly to, to write out. They generate a, a large amount of transaction log. Okay, so make sure that if you've got lots of fragmentation, you try to mitigate that using fill factors. 
okay, on your various indexes to reduce log being written out because of page splits. Right? And it could also be some kind of synchronous process like synchronous mirroring or synchronous AG or maybe even synchronous SAN replication that is causing the log writes to take a little bit longer. Right? Now one of the other things you can do is upgrade. Okay, if you're on 2008 R2 or before and you're finding that you're hitting that 32 limit to the number of outstanding IOs, you could try upgrading to 2012 and that increases that limit to 112. Okay? That's uh, easier to do I would say than re-architecting your workload. And then another thing you can do if all these other things fail is you might have to shard. You might have to split your workload up over multiple databases or maybe even multiple servers to try to reduce the amount of transaction log bottleneck. Now in 2014 there's a couple of different things that you can do to, to change the logging characteristics and those are delayed durability and in-memory OLTP. And we'll talk about those a little bit later on. So in terms of the I.O. subsystem, if you're not able to move the log file to a faster portion of the I.O. subsystem, uh, you could make sure that the I.O. subsystem is tuned correctly. So a few simple things that you could do is you know, make sure that you don't have the log file, for instance, on RAID 5. Okay? Because RAID 5, you pay a penalty every time a write occurs. Right? So you want to be on at least RAID 1 or RAID 10. Okay? Make sure that, see if you can move to better drives, okay, 15K drives, rather than, say, 7.2K SATA drives, for instance. And then you could always try moving your log file to an SSD. Now, there's a lot of internet advice that says anytime you have SSDs, always put your log files there. Now, I wouldn't follow that advice unless the log file happens to be the biggest I.O. bottleneck on my system, and there's nothing else I can do. Okay. If you've got um, any RAID controller, for instance, you might make sure that your, your RAID controller cache is set to do writes more than reads for the portion of the I.O. subsystem where the log is, because the write performance is more important you know, than read performance. And then also something you can have your I.O. subsystem admin do is just make sure there aren't any, any silly bottlenecks. Like you've upgraded all of the, the sand fabric and you've, somebody's left a one gigabyte switch in there, a one gigabit switch in there, for instance. That's a, a mistake that we've seen quite a few times with clients where they, uh, they miss a, a bottleneck in their, their I.O. subsystem. So moving on, to, moving on from raw performance to some of the other problems that you might see with the transaction log, the log might fill up. Right? So if the log fills up, right, that means that when the, the log reaches the far right-hand side of the physical log file, the log management system is going to look back to the very first VLF and say, is this inactive? In other words, can I jump back to the start and reuse this VLF and write out log records in here? Right, because the log likes to be circular in nature. It likes to fill up wraparound, fill up wraparound. If it can't do that, then the log is going to have to grow. So if, there, if the log hasn't cleared out, the log is going to have to grow. And when the log grows, right, the new portion of the log has to be zero initialized. So you don't want that to happen. You don't want the log to have to grow. Because a couple of things. Obviously, you're going to be taking a small perf hit when the log is growing. And that also means that something has gone wrong with your workload and you have a transaction that is, is larger than you thought you would need the log file to be. Okay? Now what's even worse is if the log file fills up and there's no space for the log to be able to grow, or the log is not set to auto grow, then all write activity is going to stop in your database. The transactions that are in the middle of being uh, doing writes are going to roll back. Okay? So that is, you can think of that as a, a gross performance issue. So if you find that the log is filling up and growing, then you can figure out why. You can ask SQL Server why the log is filling up. So you go to sys.databases and you query this guy, log reuse wait desk. And log reuse wait desk will tell you why the log couldn't clear the last time that it tried to clear the log. And it could be that you haven't taken a log backup for a while. Or you've got, say, database mirroring and it hasn't caught up yet. You know? Or it could say active transaction, or it could say replication. There's a bunch of different things that it could say. Right? Now, when the log fills up in 2012 or 2014, it's actually going to print a message saying why the, the log clearing couldn't be done. And it's kind of a, a little bit backwards the way that they've worded it. It should really be the transaction log for database might be as full because you haven't done a log backup or because you are running a long-running transaction. Right? So whatever log reuse, log reuse wait desk tells you, go take some corrective actions. Right, and it could be, go take a log backup, and that's going to allow the log to clear. You might have a long-running transaction that you decide to kill. Now, killing a long-running transaction isn't going to instantly 
solve the problem because that long running transaction will have to roll back before the log can then clear and so on and so on and so on. You can read through the list just as well as I can. And then whatever the problem was, make sure that you take corrective action so that the log doesn't fill up and cause a problem again. There's various different things you can do to implement monitoring. And if you've got a third party monitoring tool, you should be able to set it to monitor your transaction log space and send you an alert if it starts to get really, really full. But if you're going to kind of roll your own log monitoring, you could, there's a number of different perfmon counters you could use for each of the databases. Okay, very simple sounding things. You can alert whenever the log grows. Okay, you probably want to have an alert on to make sure that nobody is shrinking the log either. Right? Because if, the log, if somebody is shrinking the log regularly, then it's probably going to have to be growing again. And that means you're, you're taking a perfect whenever the log grows. And there's also this documented command, dbcc sql perf log space, that you can use to get the, the information on percent full for all the databases on your server. So recovery models. Somebody asked a question about recovery models and performance and whether anything is different. Now, all the stuff that I talked about in the performance monitoring and the I.O. monitoring, none of that changes how the log is flushed out to disk. None of that changes by recovery model. The recovery models change two things. Number one is when the log is allowed to clear. And number two is what gets written to the log. Okay. So in the full recovery model, everything is fully logged, and the log will not clear until you do a log backup. Right? Now I say usually not possible here until you do a log backup, because until we, when you switch to the full recovery model, until you do a full database backup, right, the log will behave as if it's in the simple recovery model. Right? It's not until you do that full, full backup that you then have to take log backups. Right? In the bulk logged recovery model, you have to take log backups, and the log won't clear until the log backup occurs. But some operations can have better performance. Some operations can be what's called minimally logged. And the minimum, minimum logging means that the only thing that's logged is the allocation of pages in the database, not the insert of records into those pages. So a couple of examples of minimally logged operations in the bulk log recovery model would be, for instance, an index build or a bulk load operation. Things that are doing lots and lots of page allocations, and then lots and lots of inserts. So for those operations only, not for regular insert, update, and delete, for those operations only, those big, big operations, they can use minimal logging in the bulk log recovery model, which generates less transaction log, which means that the log blocks aren't filling up so much, and so they're not having to be flushed out so often, and you get better performance. Right? Now, in the simple recovery model, the logging in terms of minimal logging is the same as in bulk logged. Right? But the log will clear when a checkpoint occurs. You can't do log backups. So I could summarize and say, in the full and bulk logged recovery models, the log won't clear until you do a log backup. In the bulk logged and simple recovery models, you can use minimal logging for some operations. Those are the differences between the recovery models. Right? Any questions so far? Um, yes, we have a few questions. Let me scroll a little mm -hmm. bit upper. And Dmitry Grinkevich asks, can we alter database for new log allocation during existed transaction, or may we alter? Um, I'm guessing that, that, that by new allocation he means um, change the auto growth uh, or grow the log. Yes, you can change the, the size of the auto growth while you, there are transactions running. Yes, you don't have to do that as a kind of offline operation. And then the next time the log has to, to auto grow, it will use whatever size that you changed it to. Okay. Uh, how page split influences the log file? So the, the, the reason that page splits are a problem is that when a page split occurs, it generates an, a lot of extra transaction log no matter which recovery model you're in. So when a page split happens, it's going to generate log records for the following. Allocate a new page, copy half the rows from the splitting page to the new page, change all the pages in the B tree to link to the new page. Right? And that's all done as a, uh, a special transaction called a system transaction. And it generates a lot of extra transaction log. If you go out to my, you go out to my blog and look here, this is my transaction log category. If you look for, 
Let's scroll down and I'll show you where it is. Um, there's a lot blog post called how important how how expensive sorry are our page splits. And it is I've written lots of stuff on the transaction log. There. How expensive are page splits in terms of the transaction log? And this blog post here has a, a bunch of examples that you can go create that will create page splits for you with different sizes of log records, sorry, different sizes of table records, and you'll be able to see how much more expensive a page split is compared to a regular insert. So for instance, using say like 20 byte records, I can engineer, and I've got the code in here that you can play with, engineer a case where a regular insert takes about 300 bytes of transaction log, and an insert that causes a page split generates about 13,000 bytes of transaction log. Right? So page splits are generating all this extra transaction log, and that's what makes them so expensive. So you want to try and avoid page splits, and that's going to cut down on the amount of log that's being generated for insert or update operations. Okay. Um, Dmitry Grinkevich, I didn't understand you wrote a lot of things with kind of comments on a few previous slides. If you want to ask questions, please ask again. And Andrei Zavatsky, asks what will be if transaction log is full it can auto grow and there is some free VLF in a log file will it append the new VLF or write on free VLF inside log file okay so the whether it can use the free VLFs or not depends on where the free VLFs are so actually let's go to this slide so let's say that our log is full and VLF number three is, is inactive. Okay, so it's clear. The system can't use that one. It's going to have to grow. Okay. The system can only wrap and use an earlier log file, an earlier VLF, if VLF number one, the first physical VLF in the log, is free. If the first physical VLF is not free, it will always grow the log. It has to. It can't jump around like that. Okay, so that, that answers that question. Okay, Maria, next. Um, that's it. No more questions. Okay, cool. So another kind of gross performance problem that, that you can have is having too many VLFs. This is called VLF fragmentation. Okay. And the problem with VLF fragmentation comes when you've got many, many hundreds or thousands of VLFs. And the problem comes from the most obvious one to see is to do with um, taking restoring log backups or rolling back transactions and crash recovery. Because remember I said that when a transaction rolls back, the system is going to do random log reads to, to roll back the log records in reverse order. So to be able to find the previous log record to go and roll it back, it's going to have to search through the transaction log for that log record. And that, can, that takes a long time. To, and the more VLFs you have, the longer the search is going to take. Right? So getting rid of lots of extra VLFs can speed up all kinds of different things. And there's a, a list of all the different things that you can have problems with, with having VLF fragmentation and too many VLFs. In fact, the SQL team has fixed some problems around crash recovery where there are many, many VLFs and make that go faster. But it's really up to you to make sure that you don't have too many VLFs. So here's a, a slide that I did. This is a, a survey that I did back in 2009. And this all applies today as well to all versions. And this was a survey that I did based on how big is your transaction log. And down the bottom here, we have a logarithmic scale. So this, is, this one here is 10 terabytes. Right? And here we have number of VLFs. Right? And I got data back from about 2,000 random SQL servers across the world. And if any of you gave me data back, then I, then I thank you for that. And what we can see here is a best fit line. Right? And basically anything underneath the best fit line is, I would say, acceptable. Right? And anything above it is starting to become unacceptable. So the, the, the number of VLFs you should have is kind of a gut feel thing based on the size of your transaction log. So if you had, let's say, a 100 gig transaction log and you had 300 VLFs, my gut feel is that's fine. 
if you had a 100 gig transaction log with 5,000 VLS, that's too many. Okay, and you're going to start to see performance issues. Okay. So for instance here, this one has, this is a, a one terabyte, roughly one terabyte transaction log with about 2,000 VLS. That might be perfectly fine. Okay. But here's one here. This is about 55, 60,000 VLS in a, what, 900, uh, 900 gig log. That's way too many. Way, way, way too many. So what can you do? Well, removing VLF fragmentation. First of all, how do you see how many VLFs you have? There's this command you can use. It's undocumented, unfortunately, called dbcc log info. And the number of rows of output you get is the number of VLFs that you have. Okay, so if you have more than what you think is a good number, right, then you're going to have to remove some of the VLFs. Right, so the first thing you're going to have to do is allow the log to clear, because what we're going to have to do is shrink the log down to remove some of those VLFs. So allow the log to clear by doing a log backup and then doing a shrink. Now, you might have to do that several times because you might shrink the log and it only goes back to, say, halfway through the log because that's where the, the active VLF is. So you might have to do that, that log backup shrink, log backup shrink a few times to get the log down. And if you've got a very busy system, you might not be able to shrink the log all the way down to the minimum possible size. But you'll be able to get it down to a smallish size. So once you've got the log down to a smallish size, then grow the log up in chunks. Okay. Now, the, the exact way to be able to grow the log to minimize the number of VLFs depends on which version you're on and how big your log is going to be eventually. I would go and have a look at this blog post from um, Kimberly. Paul, you have disappeared. We can't hear you. Well, I hope he comes back online. Um. Paul? Let's wait for a few seconds. Maybe he comes back. I see his screen. Okay. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Something, Thank yeah, you something, something. <laughs> yeah, okay. Some glitch on the internet. All right. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, log file provisioning. I think that this is where you, we dropped off, yeah? Yes. Okay. So, as I said already, you only need to have one log file. If you create multiple log files, it's not going to affect the performance of the transaction log. Right? You might need to have another log file temporarily. If you run out of space in your log, right, you might have to temporarily add another log file to allow the log to continue writing out. But then once you're, you're finished with that extra log file, get rid of it again. Make sure that you don't have the log files with the data files, because usually with a, your data files are usually, uh, sorry, random reads and writes in general, and the log file is sequential reads and writes in general. And having the sequential workload split up from the random workload in general gets you a uh, better performance than having them all together. And this is going to depend on your I.O. subsystem. It might not make any difference um, depending on how, how capable your I.O. subsystem is. And then for the RAID level for a log file, generally you don't want to have RAID 5. You want to have at least RAID 1 or RAID 10. Now, if your log file is on an SSD, then that means you have to have at least two SSDs with RAID 1 over the two SSDs. Okay? Otherwise, if you're only using a single SSD or a single card, that is RAID 0, and that's not acceptable. Okay? You have to protect the log. So how big should you make your log initially? Well, there's no, there's no really simple way to say oh, it should be exactly this size. What you're going to do is estimate. And the estimate's going to be based on all these different things. Right? And one of the, the simplest things is, what's the size of the largest transaction that you're going to do? And that could be some large ETL process. That single transaction has to be held in the log. Right? So the log has to be at least that big. 
how big is the biggest index rebuild that you do. So if you if you do rebuild of a, of a large clustered index in the full recovery model, that's how big your log's going to have to be at least. Okay. How often do you take log backups? It's going to have to hold all the log between the two log backups, and so on and so on. So you can come up with a, uh, a guesstimate of how big your log is going to be. Put that into production and see if the log grows and reaches a steady state size. If it reaches a steady state size, that's how big your log needs to be. So don't shrink your log every so often. I've seen people say, well, you know, once a week we do this ETL process and the log grows to 150 gig, but then we shrink it down again. Right? Don't do that. If your log needs to be a certain size once a week, then that's how big your log should be. Right? You're not going to have a performance issue because your log is a bit bigger. Right? You will have a performance issue if you continually shrink the log and then it has to grow and grow and grow every week or so. So talking about auto growth, you want to, you, I could sum up this entire s slide and say, make sure you've got auto growth turned on so that your log can grow if it needs to and make sure you've got your auto growth size set appropriately. Don't have it set to a percentage. You want it set to a specific size and the specific size is going to really take into account how fast is your I.O. subsystem. Because when the log grows, it needs to be zero initialized. SQL Server writes out a bunch of zeros right, to the transaction log. So how fast can your I.O. subsystem write out that new portion of the transaction log? So your auto growth size, depending on your I.O. subsystem, is going to be somewhere between you know, a quarter of a gigabyte and maybe one or two gigabytes. If you've got your, your auto growth size to set to something like 10 gig, that's probably going to be too big. And there's going to be a noticeable pause in transaction log throughput while the log is growing if it needs to. Right. So I said I'd talk about a couple of the new features that were added in 2014 around transaction log performance. So I'm going to talk about these just for a couple of minutes, and I'm going to do a demo of delayed durability for you. So in-memory OLTP or Hecaton. Now, obviously, this is something that we could talk about for hours and hours and hours. But to be honest, not a huge amount of people are using this in production yet. So I don't have anybody that's using it in any way that's going to allow me to tell you anything different from what's in books online. So rather than waste your time and talk about a bunch of stuff that you can read about in books online, I'm going to point you there and say MSDN has a very comprehensive section on Hecaton. And there's also a couple of good white papers about Hecaton as well, one about using it and one about the internals of it. So I recommend you read through those white papers. The reason I haven't seen a lot of people using it is it's complicated to do. It's not just a turn it on and walk away. It's a, a fundamental change in how your workload operates. And you have to rework portions of your workload to be able to cope with OLTP because it, it, it doesn't use locks, it doesn't use latches. So you have to be able to cope with things that you're doing failing and then you have to retry them again. So you're going to have to change a bunch of your code. You're going to have to change the kind of paradigm that your developers have and how they expect things to work. So it's not just a, a very simple drop-in performance enhancement. But I have seen people use it for ETL processes, where if you have an ETL process that uh, has a data source, copies the data into SQL Server, and then from that copy in SQL Server, reads it again and inserts it into, say, a data warehouse. I've seen people use the, the in-memory LTP for that intermediate database where the, the SQL Server data is just dumped temporarily. Right? So that can, that can speed things up a lot there. Now the other feature is delayed durability. Um, with delayed durability, what this does is it changes the way that the log works. So remember earlier on I had you that little slide that said when a transaction commits the log block has to be flushed to disk. Well, delayed durability allows you to change that so that the, the log block doesn't get flushed to disk when a transaction commits. And the log block only gets flushed to disk when the log block fills up to its full size of 60K. Okay. So you can, uh, by default, this is turned off. Okay. So you get the behavior that I described. If you turn it on and force everything to be delayed durab durable, okay, then log blocks only flush to disk when they fill up. You can also set delay durability to be allowed, in which case, per transaction, you have to say whether you've got delay durability on or off. Now, the downside of this is if you turn it on, then when you commit a transaction, it's not durable on disk. So you might be told that your transaction committed and you have a crash and the effect of your transaction is not there because the log block wasn't flushed to disk before the system crashed. 
And you might say, well, I'm only going to use 60K, lose 60K's worth of data, right? No. Whatever transaction committed in that log block, you lose potentially all of the operation. So that could be a very long-running transaction. Right? Now, in that case, though, if you've got long-running transactions, you probably don't want to, say, set everything to be delayed durable. Now, you might say allowed, and then that specific transaction, you say uh, delayed durability is off. But then lots of your little tiny transactions, the ones that are going to cause little tiny log block flushes, you might say that delayed durability is on for them. So you could mix and match it depending on what you want to do. So there's the, the drawback. So you get this potential performance boost, but at the potential of having some data loss. So if you have a service level agreement with your business of zero data loss, you should not turn this on, because right? you run the risk of some data loss. If you are allowed to have some data loss, which some people are, then you might consider turning this on. Okay? And I'll show you a demo of this in a second, just to show you how powerful it could be. Now the data loss risk it also extends to log backups and synchronous mirroring and synchronous AGs, because if a log block isn't on disk, it's not going to be backed up. And if your transaction commits with, say, synchronous mirroring, and it's set to delay durable, the log block doesn't get flushed out. And so the log block doesn't get copied over to your synchronous mirror right, until it fills up and then flushed out. So the synchronous part of synchronous mirroring or synchronous AGs only applies when you've got transactions that the commit is flushed to disk. So let's have a quick look at that, and then we will be done. So delayed durability. Let's get rid of this and this and this, because we don't need all this stuff. So what I'm going to do is I've got my little USB stick again, and I'm going to recreate my database with the log file on that USB stick. And then I'm going to create a very simple scenario. And I'm running on 2014, obviously. And I'm going to make sure the delayed durability is turned off. And then I'm going to create this little scenario, very contrived, where I've got a, a small table, and I've got three rows in my table, and then I'm going to have 50 clients fire up, and each client is going to do update bad key table set C1 equals C1 plus 1. So each transaction is going to do, each client is going to do begin tran, update, 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 taking exclusive lock, exclusive lock, exclusive lock, and then it's going to commit. So only one transaction at a time can be doing this update. So did I run that? Yes, I did. Let's go ahead and do this. So I'm going to fire up perfmon. And what we're going to do is we're going to watch what's going on in our database. So in our database's perfmon object here, I'm going to add in log flushes per second and also transactions per second for my slow log file database like this. So we've got nothing going on right now, so let's fire up our 50 clients and look back at perfmon. And we've got our log flushes per second. I'll highlight it by hitting backspace, and now that's in black. So our log flushes per second is, what, about 1,500 per second. And if we look at our transactions per second, it's the exact same line, because all the transactions are, are blocked, essentially, by everything else. Only one transaction at a time can be holding those locks. And the locks don't get released until the transaction commits. Okay, so we've got a bottleneck here in the transaction log. Now watch this. I'm going to turn on delayed durability. So the black line is transactions per second. Okay? And the red line is log flushes per second. So what we did was all of our log blocks now only get flushed out when they fill up rather than when each transaction commits. So our log block, our log flushes per second dropped down to about 250 and our transactions per second increased to about 5,000. So that's a pretty profound difference. Right? So I think what we're going to see is even people that aren't allowed to have any data loss, if their workload can have the same profound effect by having delayed durability turned on, I think people are going to turn it on. Right? But if you're able to have data loss on your system, then and you have the log as a bottleneck, 
I would absolutely try this to see if it makes any difference. Now, saying that, we had a, a, a client this last week that I was working with Tim Radney, and the log was a bottleneck, and we tried turning on delayed durability to see if it would help, and it made no difference at all, because their workload wasn't one that had that kind of blocking that was causing issues. But you might have a, a workload where that can be a, 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 an issue. Okay. So very interesting stuff there. So I'm going to carry on just in my last slide. So I've gone a little bit over time. And then we'll stop for questions. So just to summarize, you want to be making sure that you monitor what's going on in your I.O. subsystem. And you want to be monitoring weight statistics. And just in general, not even just talking about the transaction log. You want to be monitoring those things. And you're going to have all the scripts and pointers to, to blog posts that's going to allow you to do all of that. Now, in general, you want to have the log in the fastest portion of the I.O. subsystem. Because right? the log often is a bottleneck. If, if most of you go and run weight statistics analysis on your servers, you'll see write log as one of the most prevalent weight types. And the, one of the easiest things you can do to fix that is move the log to a faster portion of the I.O. subsystem. But also make sure that you don't have a bunch of unwanted log records from things like page splits and from having extra non-clustered indexes that aren't being used. Now, in terms of large performance issues with the log, make sure that you're monitoring the, the log to, make, to see that it's not filling up and isn't going to have to auto-grow. You want to avoid that if you can. Right? So make sure your log is sized correctly. And also make sure that you don't have VLF fragmentation. You don't have thousands and thousands of VLFs are causing you performance issues with, for instance, uh, crash recovery or log file restores and stuff like that. And then you might also think about these 2014 new features. And the, the, the simplest one to consider is delayed durability. But just make sure you remember that it does have the potential for some data loss. So in terms of resources, there's my main blog category in the transaction log. There's also a bunch of blog posts that I've done on SQL Centuries, sqlperformance.com blog around transaction log monitoring. And then there's a, a article that I wrote for TechNet Magazine back in 2009 that talks about how the log works under the covers. And then there's a couple of longer online courses. This one is seven hours long, and this one's four and a half hours long. And you can watch those on plural sites. And again, if you want to watch those completely for free, no, no catches or anything at all, just send me an email, and I'll send you a trial code later on today, and you can watch that. Or if you're watching this on the, the YouTube, then just, again, send me an email. Just make sure you say user group, full site email code, and you can get one. And with that, we are done. So any, any last questions, Maria? We have only one question. Um, was asked a while ago. Mm -hmm. um, any way to run DBCC log info without SA or DB owner permissions? No, unfortunately not. The, that DBCC command, because it's an undocumented command, um, all the undocumented commands, you have, to be, you have to have sysadmin permissions to be able to run that. Now, that, that was the case always, and I continued that when I changed all the DBCC back in 2005, and nobody has changed that since then. The only thing I can, uh, I can say is if you want to get that changed, then submit a connect item and see if they'll change that. But I'd be very, very surprised if they will change that at this point. Guys, any more questions? Please ask. Uh, Don't forget, you can always send me a question at uh, Paul at SQL Skills as well. Michael Zilberstein is asking, is it possible to combine in-memory database with the delayed durability? If, pos if positive, can we benefit from it? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know whether you can you can do that because in memory LTP you can also you can specify whether the the whether the logging is just for the schema or whether for the data as well. So you can have some logging within memory LTP. It's not it's not always no logging at all. Um, my guess would be yes. I don't know for certain, but my guess would be yes because the logging that occurs is just the same in terms of the mechanism under the covers is just the same as it is for regular databases. It's only the, the, um, the data portion that's in memory. But I don't know 100%. Okay. I, think Somebody wants to, if, I think it's apart from atomic transaction definition if it's dur durable, durable or not. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, it, it's, it's orthogonal. So I think you, you should be able to turn it on. Um, and it will have the same effect as I just showed you. Yeah. 
Right. But uh, I, I would check to make sure because I don't know 100%. I haven't tried it. So that's why I say I'm not 100%. Now, the second part of the question was, would it benefit your workload? I don't know. It depends on what your workload is doing. If your workload is such that transactions are holding locks until the transaction commits, and those locks are blocking other transactions from, from continuing, then the faster you can have that commit occur, the less you're going to be blocking. And so if you remove the log flush from the, the commit transaction, that makes the transaction commit faster, and so you don't have quite so much blocking. So uh, it depends on your workload, basically, whether you're going to get a benefit from using delayed durability or not. I don't see any questions. Guys, you, you want to ask something else? Or are we going to finish? No, I don't see anything. Okay, let's wrap it up. I thank you very much for coming. It was an interesting session. Thank you. We appreciate your time spent for us. You're, you're very welcome. And uh, thank you again for letting me speak. Uh, I'll send you all the, the zip file and PDF, and uh, I'll talk to you on email. Thank you. And you have, a, you'll have a lot of thank you, thank you, thank you in the questions. In the okay. I already see them coming. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for listening, everybody. Thank you, and have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.